What's up everyone, I'm Eldritch and welcome back to What is Total Warhammer? The show in which I explore why Total Warhammer is such a special case in the Total War franchise. This week we are going to talk about units and their balancing. As I had already alluded to in the first video, Total Warhammer is going to require quite a different approach than the previous Total War games. Because there are giant monsters, repeating cannons, flying units, monster cavalry, heroes and wizards. And all of these still have to work together to make an enjoyable game, which means they have to be balanced. Normally, Total Warhammer, Empire and Napoleon excluded, focuses on time periods that very much revolve around melee infantry, archers and cavalry. And so far, Creative Assembly has always chosen to represent this in a basic sort of rock-paper-scissors format. In most Total War games, every unit has a specific thing that they are good at. Spearmen, for example, are really good against cavalry. Whether the cavalry charges into spearmen or the spearmen charge into the cavalry doesn't really matter. The cavalry is not going to come out on top. This is because spearmen gain a very high bonus attack against cavalry. Cavalry, on the other hand, is really, really good at beating lightly armored units such as archers and skirmishers. Archers and skirmishers may be fast, but they are of course nowhere near as fast as cavalry. And so cavalry generally becomes a flanking force that takes out the squishy units behind the main force of the army. Archers and skirmishers, on the other hand, are designed to defeat the enemy infantry. This is because the infantry is simply not fast enough to keep up with the lightly armored and mobile skirmishers who can fire at them, turn around, run away and keep their distance. In skirmish mode, the melee infantry will never reach the skirmishers. And as you can see here, with two units of skirmishers working together, infantry stands absolutely no chance and gets completely obliterated. These are the basic interactions between unit types, but there are some more specific ones. For example, sword infantry in most Total War games is designed to defeat spear infantry. This is because sword infantry gets a bonus attack against infantry. Now this is not entirely historically accurate because generally speaking over a thousand year periods spears dominate the battlefield and having a really long spear is better than having a much shorter sword because generally you get poked with the spear before you get to actually use your sword. However, in the context of Total War, it absolutely makes sense, because otherwise there would be no point in using anything but spearmen, and swordsmen and axemen are absolutely 100% historically accurate. These units did exist. Sword and axe infantry was mostly used in keep sieges, where the surroundings would be so tightly packed that using a spear would be really difficult and awkward. In such tight confines, having a sword, a siaxa or an axe would be simply superior to a really long spear that would constantly get stuck everywhere. But because Total War doesn't really care about that sort of thing all too much, they decided that sword infantry simply beats spear infantry. And axe infantry is kind of just the cheaper version of sword infantry. Whenever the Mongols, Huns or their descendants are part of Total War, you will also have cavalry archers. And I have to say, in a lot of Total War games, cavalry archers are pretty damn overpowered. Total War Attila being one of the prime examples. So I would really kind of say cavalry archers beat everything. But then on the other hand, limited ammunition in Total War games beats cavalry archers. If you have an entire army of cavalry archers, you probably still don't have enough ammunition to kill an entire enemy army. And so that fact alone forces you to take other stuff than just horse archers. But cavalry archers are definitely pretty damn strong. In the Total War games focused in the first millennium, we also have skirmisher cavalry. This is cavalry with javelins. Something that was most notably used by Celtic and Germanic tribes. And with these units, I will say that they beat everything if you know how to use them well, and pretty much lose to everything if you play them badly. And lastly, we have artillery. And artillery is really good at beating turtling. Ouch! Yeah, that'll teach me to turtle. As I discussed in part two of this series, there are specific things that the Warhammer universe adds, such as monsters, magic, and mighty heroes, that will absolutely influence how the battles are played. And now it's time to look exactly how this dynamic is going to impact the usual Total War formula. 
Total Warhammer is still going to have spearmen, it's still going to have swordsmen, and it's also going to have two-handed weapon warriors. It will have cavalry and archers or other ranged units such as handgunners or crossbowmen. But it will also have a few categories that the other Total War games have never had, such as Flyers, Monster Cavalry, Monsters, Monster Slayers, and Heroes. Now I perused the game's official wiki, but I still couldn't really find any conclusive information on what is exactly going to counter what, but from having pretty much watched all of their videos as closely as I could, I have concluded the following. Monsters and Monster Cavalry will counter practically all infantry, with a small amount of exceptions. Monster Cavalry being cavalry, it will also be really good against archers and other ranged units. And presumably will also not be that great against spearmen, because again, they are cavalry. Monster Slayers, however, are also infantry and they are going to be specialized to deal with monsters and monster cavalry. Prime example of this are the Slayers in the Dwarf Faction. Crazy Berserkers who are trying to get their honor back by fighting the most ridiculous monsters they can find. Those guys are going to be pivotal to taking out those Greenskin or Chaos Giants. Siege Tanks, Terror Geists, Vargulfs, whatever you can imagine really. I presume other factions are also going to have units that count as monsters and it was mentioned in one of the battle reports that the Empire Halberdiers are also really good against monsters. But seeing how the only monster slayer units that we've seen so far are all very lightly armored infantry, it is pretty safe to assume that they will fall like flies to ranged units and regular cavalry. Now with flyers it's a little bit more difficult to pinpoint exactly what they are going to be good at. And that is because there are so many different types of flyers. You have the bat swarms of the vampires, you have the pegasus knights of Bretonia, and then there's also huge flying monsters like wyverns or griffins, and I assume those are just going to be good against all normal sort of infantry and cavalry units, simply by virtue of being a much stronger unit. But in general I think flyers are going to be really good against archers, ranged units in general, artillery, and any smaller, weaker units, provided that they can get there first. All of these flying units look pretty squishy, so I would assume that if the ranged units get a few good rounds of shooting at them, they might not even make it there. But if you can sneak around or get past the shooting somehow, you will probably tear those ranged units apart. From the Let's Plays that we've seen, heroes are really difficult to kill, and they do a lot of damage. Taking a hero into battle boosts the power of your army quite significantly. But on the other hand, it didn't really look like heroes had anything that they were particularly and specifically good at. It just seemed like they were powerful fighters that took forever to die, and pretty easily dispatched of a couple of guys in their way until reinforcement finally arrives. And all of this leaves us with a much more complicated balancing grid. Now this is of course dangerous, because Creative Assembly obviously will have to try to balance all of this, and that is going to be a tightrope act if I've ever seen one. But if they can pull that balance off, then this game is going to be tactically absolutely fantastic. And this is why I'm personally so excited for this game. Total War games are already so very tactical. And just adding on more tactical options on top of that and adding more decisions that you're going to have to make in battle as to what you're going to engage with what and how you're going to move your troops to achieve the best possible engagement, there's so much this can offer to the game. And that is it for episode 4 of What is Total Warhammer. If you are enjoying this series, please consider liking and if you haven't already, also consider subscribing. There is one more episode to go in this series, but until then, I've been the Cloaking Donkey, and I'll see you in another video!